I've been hinting about this for a while. Now it's time to tell it. You may like it or not, but now, my words and your imagination. We are going to create terrifying stories together. Long before I was born, all Lamassus flew away, left their guard points for a reason long forgotten, and hover over the cedar forest. As a desperate act, the old kings ordered the stone carvers to make Lamassus statues on every major city gate. It didn't take long for the savages to find out the doors were unguarded. Soon after, they destroyed the Assyrian Empire. Assyrians burned the bridges between Lamassus, and Lamassus burned anyone who gets close to their precious forest. That was the time when the sorcerers showed up. A sorcerer could call the precious metals and minerals under the earth, or could turn mundane things into beautiful objects. Sorcerers had wealth, but they didn't have youth. They believed Lamassu's body parts have incredible healing powers. They recruited brave men who didn't seem afraid of Lamassus and equipped them with Kargu, a tall spear with a very pointed tip. Once, my father said, you need seven men to hunt down an elephant and only two men are enough to take down a bear or a lion. But if you hunt a Lamassu, you need to do it by yourself. Because the moment the Lamassu falls, your partner becomes your enemy. There is a reason for that. A shirt made of Lamassu hair pays very handsomely. If you sell four hooves, you don't need to hunt the entire season. If you bring the fifth leg, the ghost leg of the Lamassu, you don't have to worry about how to feed your family over a year. But the essential part of the Lamassu is the feather. I said feather because feathers go bad very quickly. To retrieve a Lamassu feather, one must pluck it while the beast is giving his last breath. A dead Lamassu's feather turn into dust very fast. If you can bring one Lamassu feather to a sorcerer, you don't have to worry about it financially because you will have enough wealth for the rest of your life. There were only three people who were able to retrieve a feather successfully in history. My father was one of them. Have you ever seen a Lamassu feather up close? I did. My father laid it in my hands before he gave it to the sorcerer. It was the size of a short sword. The while of the feather was so flexible, it was impossible to rip it. When you carry the edges of the feather, it makes a very eerie but relaxing sound. And the colors. Colors that you have never seen or never named before. Colors so mesmerizing, someone has to nudge you to wake you up from a sweet trance. Like the wings of a butterfly, the feather leaves shimmer whatever it touches. Even today, if I hold my hands to the sky during the sunrise or sunset, you can see the colors dancing in my palms. Both my grandfather and my father work for a sorcerer called Sargis. I saw him once when I was a kid. My father told me Sargis looked the same since his childhood, not one line on his face. And now, Sargis, in front of me, sitting in his black robes, looked the same. You would think he's a very young man, unexperienced, never had to work on a farm or throw a fishing net to the river. But that feeling would go away 
the moment he starts to speak. The feather your father gave me has taken from me. I have no interest in going after it. You have your father's and his father's knowledge. I interrupted him. My father's knowledge gone with him when he died. There are two hunters in the village. They still go to the cedar forest and chase the beast. One of his guards pulled a crushed human head from a bag. Sargis pointed at the skull. That's one of them. The other hunter left the town when he heard that I'm walking on the streets. I don't think anybody will see him for a while. I said, I'm a fisherman. I catch fish. He smirked at me. Rivers are dried. Lakes evaporated. When did you go fishing last time? What is your wife cooking today? What are your kids going to eat tonight? I didn't answer. A sunbeam hit the floor, bounced into the room. Sargis turned bright blue. I thought, it must be the feathers effect. Like my palms, Sargis's body reacts to light. His other guard put two gold nuggets onto the table, each size of a strawberry and a stone i never seen before. Three of them looked at the stone in awe, like Ishtar just summoned herself into the room. Sargis pointed at the first nugget. With this, you can pay what you owe to the merchants and move your family to a better land. Now he was pointing at the other nugget. With this one, you can buy two fishing boats and hire someone to work for you. And this one, he paused. You don't have to worry about your children's future. Bring me a Lamasu feather and change your life. There is nothing wrong with our life, said my wife. She spoke the first time since Sargis entered our house. She pointed to the human head that the guard is holding. Put that thing away. It pulls all the flies here and scares my children. Sargis turned dark green on a whim and looked at me. Are you letting her talk to your guests like this? My wife didn't change her tone. Take your shoes off, all of you. Three of them started to take their shoes off in a hurry. One of the guards took the sandals and put them neatly next to each other by the door. While this happening, Sargis looked at me impatiently. I said, Dina, enough. There are guests. My wife took our youngest kid and left the room without saying anything. Sargis pointed at the pole in the middle of the house. I see you use your father's weapon as a support to keep your home intact. That was the cargo both my grandfather and my father used. A weapon made of wood and magic, eight steps high, grayish-green color with hues of pink. Cargo is not a stick to get dry and cracked under a dusty roof, said the sorcerer. I designed it to put a lamasu on the ground. I created it to soak in lamasu blood. I made it to stab lamasu heart. He was dark purple now. I said, if it doesn't support the roof, my house will collapse slowly. He said, if you bring me the feather, you don't have to live in this house, fisherman. He stood up and walked to the cargo. You know it feeds on blood. He took out a long needle from his sleeves and punctured his index finger. And then he put his hands on the cargo. Sargis closed his eyes. The grayish-green lines on the cargo slightly changed and rearranged themselves. I said, it never rained since the spring. We must have sunny days. You cannot hurt a Lamasu when the sun is around. Sargis looked at me. Oh, you don't worry about the sun. I'll take care of it for you. Sargis and both of his guards now held the cargo. They rattled it and took it out of its place. Something cracked, and dust fell from the roof. I looked at the edge of the cargo. It was so pointy, I was almost not able to see the tip of it.
After two days of walking, I was on a hill near Cedar Forest. When I was a kid, my father used to take me here. This area is still watching spot for hunters. It is safe because you can see the entire forest from above and spot them flying lamassus. Cedar Forest is beautiful, but not a place for humans. In this forest, you have to hunt during the daytime because other things will hunt you during the night. I had the cargo on my right shoulder. It was light as a straw, but when you jump on a lamassu, it weighs like a boulder. It was a sunny day, but above the forest, clouds were gathering up. Those were the first clouds I've seen for a very long time. It must be the work of Sargis, I thought. No lamassu fly when it's cloudy. It is impossible to kill a lamassu on a sunny day. Their feathers can catch the sunlight very quickly, and they can aim the light back at you. Imagine thousands of sunbeams directed at you. Lamassus kill humans by incinerating them. If you are lucky, otherwise they give you a painful death. They stomp on you. I started to walk to the forest while the first drops of rain hit to the boulders around me. It sounded like thousands of tiny hands were clapping. A good omen. My father told me once, all Lamassus flew away because we forgot that they are conscious beings and treated them lesser than us. Another time, he told me they flew away because they become arrogant. But the first reason stuck with me until today. They flew because we humans treat them as mindless tools. Maybe that's why I never followed my father and his father's way until now. I stopped in front of a big hoof print. It was fresh. Mud was wrinkling and falling into the track. A lamassu passed here no longer than a minute and I didn't even hear a sound. As big as an African elephant, yet silent as a cat. One thing I know, if a lamassu passed here, it will be back. Lamassus map their route like a shrew and stick to the map. I changed my direction and I saw a lucky tree that I can climb on. Hunters call them the lucky trees. Five generations older than the other trees around them. These trees are taller and they have more branches to climb to rise above the Lamassus eyesight. All you have to do is wait patiently until a Lamassu shows up. Just like spear fishing, you wait for the right moment and throw the spear. The only difference is you jump with Karge onto the beast. You have to impale Lamassu from its back. Karge only stops when it bursts out of the Lamassu's chest and nails him to the ground. That's how you hunt a Lamassu, just like spear fishing. While I was waiting, a voice broke the calmness of the rain. I heard it in my ears. No, the sound formed between my ears. It repeated. You old cargo, but you no wonder. You old cargo, but you no wonder. I looked down, but I didn't see anything first. Karg started to pulse in my hands. Suddenly, something starting to form on the ground. Something big, with the face of a human. Alamasu appeared in thin air, 20 steps down, looking straight at me. 
The Lamassu's mouth was moving, but I heard him like he was standing next to me. I have noticed one of his legs was missing and balancing himself with his ghost leg, which is not that strong. Maybe he was hunted once and managed to escape. He knew I was out of his league. I shivered. Suddenly a river of memories rushed into my mind. Memories of my family, new and old. My three kids. My Dina. When I first saw her near a field. Bird of my youngest. Me teaching fishing to my oldest. And how he accidentally released all the day's catch. That day, he made me very angry. All of these memories disappeared very fast, as they showed up. Leave Cargo, go home. Leave Cargo, go home. Is that how my father felt? Before each time he jumped, he had memories of home, my mom and me. I squeezed the Cargo in my hands. I thought, just like spear fishing. I heard that voice again. I am no fish. I am no fish. Leave cargo, go home. Leave cargo. I said, no feather, no home, no feather, no food, no feather, no wealth. I don't know why I said the last one. You can't explain a Lamassu the anxiety of being in debt. He didn't respond. Instead, I felt that breeze in my mind again. At that moment, I knew he was looking at my memories and all the trouble that I'm going through. Finally, he said, If you face a Lamassu during an attack, you have no advantage at all. But this one is crippled. He is barely standing on his fifth leg. Also, he is not flying due to the clouds that Sargis cast over the forest. I aimed the cargo's tip at the Lamassu. It started to pulse even faster, and each pulse, it was getting heavier. Light as a straw, heavy as a boulder when you jump. I used the weight of the cargo and jumped at the Lamassu. There is no turning back now. I had no control of the cargo in the air. All I could do to hold on to it as tight as possible. It didn't feel like I was falling from a tree. Instead, it felt like someone was pulling me down to the ground. I gasped. All the air in my chest left my lungs. At the same time, Lamassu leaped. There was no anger or pity on his face, just a straight look. Our eyes met the halfway of my fall, and I realized I missed. There was nothing to slow Karga down. It stabbed the dirt and slammed me to the ground. Both my legs got broken at the same time. Karga slipped away from my grip and disappeared in front of me into the earth. It doesn't stop until it bursts a Lamassu's chest. 
Lamassu flapped his wings only once, and the gust of the feathers punched out a hole in the clouds. Sun shined behind him. He opened his wings and started to float above me. Each feather looked like a sun, getting brighter. There are no words for this. I feel warm. The fisherman got incinerated in a small fraction of a second. His death was so fast, he didn't even feel his skin got burned. Lamassu landed on his three feet and balanced himself on the fifth leg. The only thing left from the fisherman was just a pile of ashes. Lamassu stood in front of those ashes for a brief amount of time. Clouds that Sargis prepared start to dissipate. Lamassu looked up and flew away. The gust of his wings blew the fisherman's ashes all over the forest. The cargo that used for three generations continued to go down to the core of the earth. There, it got destroyed. Mesopotamia region entered the night cycle. Before the sunrise on earth, 93 million miles away, in the core of the sun, two hydrogen atoms become helium. That helium joined the helium pile formed by the other hydrogen atoms and start to radiate. As a result, photons burst out and they begin their 8 minute and 20 second journey to the Earth. Back in the fisherman's town, a night guard was walking on the streets and trying to stay awake before his shift ends. A sudden gust of wind hit him and blew his helmet off. The bronze helmet fell on the ground and made a loud dangling sound on the empty street. The guard looked up while he was picking up his helmet, but he didn't see anything unusual on the sky. In the fisherman's house, Dina and her three kids were sleeping. Under the slowly collapsing roof, there were flower pots placed around. These were ordinary plants, but it was enough to change the mood of the house. It felt like home, very cozy. One of the pots had three Lamassu feathers stabbed on the soil. Those photons, which left the sun eight minutes ago, reached the fisherman's house and bounced on the floor. One of the feathers caught the bouncing light and reflected on Dina's face. Dina opened her eyes.